In this video, we're going to go over initial configuration in TraceView. This video assumes that you've already instrumented some sort of web application, and you're starting to see data in the default app as seen here. The first thing we're going to do is go to the app configuration page. This page is used to organize the data within TraceView. You can see we're already seeing a lot of traffic and a lot of different layers uh, in our default app. If we click on Apache here, we see we have Apache running on five different hosts. Looks like we have some production hosts and a staging host. What we want to do is, is separate those out into their own applications. Let's do that now. We're going to create a new app called Example Prod. Now, what we're going to do is take Apache on one of our production hosts, and we're going to move it to our new app. Now, we only moved Apache, and we're not going to move the child layers, such as PHP or database layer. Those will automatically move over to this new app as requests come into Apache on this example prod host. Let's do the same thing for our staging traffic. created a new app called Example Staging, and now we're going to move uh, Apache again. And we're moving Apache because that's the entry point for this application. That's the first place that a HTTP request is going to hit this application. So we're going to move Apache from our staging server to our staging application. Now, before we leave this page, uh, we're also going to add some tags. So this is a production app. We're going to tag it as such. Now, normally we would stay here and we would move all the Apache layers and all the entry points into new apps until there's nothing left in default. Uh, for this video, let's move back to the overview charts and see what we've done. So now you can see we still have the default app because there's still some hosts that are tracing into there. But we've created the example prod app and now any requests coming into Apache on that uh, the hosts that we assigned to this app are coming into here. Now, if we were to complete the steps on the last page, we would move all of the production hosts that are serving the, this example app uh, into this application, so all the data um, is segregated uh, and makes sense for our architecture. In the previous steps, we also added tags to these apps, such as production here. Um, if you had maybe dozens of apps, some of them production, some of them staging, and serving different applications, we can filter to tags on the left-hand side. So now we're only showing applications that have the tag production. You can also create views, which are combinations of tags, such as production and example, and create your own tags to take your apps. Now that we've configured our application and we're starting to get some um, seg segregated traffic into this app, let's take a look and organize a little bit further. As you can see, we only moved the Apache layer, but we're getting lots of child layers coming in here, which is great. The next thing we're going to do is configure AppDex. AppDex is an industry standard way to have an at-a-glance value of the performance of your web server. To change these values, you can hit the Configure button, which I just did here, and these values are used to calculate the overall AppDex score. It's based on a percentage of requests that fall under the satisfaction threshold and a percentage of requests that fall within the tolerating threshold. If you need more information on how these calculations are done, click on the documentation link and it will explain them. You can also create custom AppDex groups. If there is an endpoint in your application that typically takes longer, uh, maybe an authentication endpoint, you can create a custom AppDex score and a custom AppDex group for that endpoint. The last thing you need to do within the UI to configure TraceView is go to Alerts. Uh, alerts are a great way to, to know when there's a performance issue with your application. You can name your alert whatever you'd like. And here we can apply the alert, the alert to a specific app or all apps. 
let's create an alert for our, our production host or our production application. And we'll create an alert um, based on application performance. Um, this is overall latency of that application. For example, if we create an alert for 500 milliseconds, we can be alerted if the overall latency, for example, broad app, uh, exceeds 500 milliseconds. You can also use a weighted average for this value, uh, which is a 15 minute exponential moving average. We can also be alerted on host metrics, uh, error rates, or HTTP, HTTP status codes. Uh, you can set who the alerts are emailed to. You can also filter your alerts by layer. For example, if there is such as an authentication endpoint um, in your application, we could we could do that by um, we could do that by URL. I'll put in the URL in uh, down below. We can also filter to layers such as a language layer, uh, a database layer, and so forth. If we were to select a layer, let's touch the MySQL, at this point, when we're measuring latency, we're measuring latency of just the MySQL layer. So just the, aver the, the average uh, latency of that layer, so calls to MySQL. So it's not um, latency of web requests anymore, it's latency of that specific layer. You can create as many alerts as you like, and I recommend you to do, do so. Um, typically, it makes sense to create different alerts uh, for your production hosts, um, your different applications you have, uh, and your staging environments. That's it for initial configuration. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is the app configuration page. We were already there before, and we were manually dragging layers over to assign them to new apps. If you have an auto-scaling environment, and this seems tedious to you, uh, we do have an API where we can make this uh, a little bit more automatic. Uh, if you're interested in using our API, please check out our documentation site at docs.appdata.com. In this video, we're going to go over the TraceView user interface. We're going to cover which features are available to us, what kind of data we have available, and then how to use that data to solve real-world application problems. We're starting on the overview of the charts page which is essentially the landing page for TraceView. This page gives us a high-level overview of the performance of all our applications. For example, this Django application, which somebody has configured, we have a graph of latency over time for that application. Uh, we also have the average latency sh uh, shown here for the same time period. Um, we have a request per minute, which is volume coming into the application, which is also graphed down below. Uh, we have our error rate, and we have our app deck score for that application. Keep in mind when you're looking at this page that all the values you see here are reflective of the time period that's selected at the top. For example, right now we're looking at the past hour for all these apps. If we click on the day, well then we'll be looking at the past 24 hours and so forth. This page is used to give you an added glance of how your applications are performing. It's also used to locate where a problem is taking place. For example, you may have lots of applications or maybe distributed architecture, or your front-end applications they call some back-end applications. And if you're troubleshooting a performance issue, this is one of the first places you could come and figure out at which location or which application is the problem actually occurring in. We actually have three pages to cover the same idea. We have the overview charts, we have the overview list, which is really the same information in a faster loading page uh, and it's displayed in, in a sortable table instead of charts. We also have the overview map. This is a fairly new feature for TraceView, and what it does is it shows you the relationships between your applications and gives you an idea of your architecture. For example, we have a Django app here. This is just named Django. Somebody configured this application and named it Django. We can see here that the Django app makes a remote call to the Google, Google APIs. And there's also a .NET application that's making calls to Django. If you have your alerts configured correctly in TraceView uh, and you come to this page, if an application is, is crossing an alert threshold, it'll actually be flashing red. So this page can give you uh, an idea of where the, where the performance problem is occurring uh, very quickly. You could load this page, see an application that's flashing red, and you could quickly identify where the problem is. Uh, 
we also have network monitoring built into this. So if you have the latest versions of our instrumentation with what we call the sequencer installed, if you click on one of these uh, connections or relationships between um, an application and an external resource, you can actually follow this link and, and see the um, network performance between these two, um, between the application and the external resource. If we were looking at an application, let's say Ruby on Rails here, if we were looking at Ruby on Rails and we, there was a performance issue there, um, you can see their latency, um, the host involved, the error rate, uh, and the request per minute, so the, the volume uh, over on the right-hand side here. If, if there was a problem there, say it was crossing an alert threshold and it's flashing red, if we want to dig into that and see what the real problem is, the next thing we would do is go to the app server page for this, for Ruby on Rails. Now we're on the app server page. So this is where the real, uh, a lot of the real data for Tracy lies. The first thing we're looking at here uh, is a latency chart. So latency for requests coming into Ruby on Rails application broken down into separate layers. You can see the, the colors up here match with the colors down below. If you hover over a layer, it tells you which, uh, the name of that layer and, and the latency at that time. For example, if we see the spike here, at this point in time, the average request that came in was spending about 650 milliseconds in the Django layer and about 83 milliseconds in the Action View layer, and so forth. Keep in mind that when you're looking at this graph, this is average latency. So this is what the majority of your users are experiencing when they visit your Ruby on Rails app. This page is really used for two things. It's used for uh, optimizing your code. We can find slow points and corner cases in your code. And it's, using for, it's used for incident response. The first thing we're going to look at is um, using this page to optimize your code. Below the latency charts, uh, we have lots of different filters. We have domains, we have URLs, we have controllers and actions, we have hosts, and we even have queries. Now what we can use these for is we can sort these tables and find those corner cases in our code that might not be very efficient. If we sort our URLs by average duration, we can find that this URL here, on average, takes about three seconds. Um, that's 10 times longer than the next URL. So if you're, if you're a developer and you're using this to find, you know, maybe where is the host allocating most of his resources spending time on a specific URL, this is a great place to come and do that. If we now click on this URL, it will filter down to show us only data that's related to that specific endpoint. So now we're only showing average latency and breaking it down by layer for requests that came into uh, this Ruby on Rails application uh, to this specific domain, this specific URL. This is a great way to dig into your data and really see what's going on. If we want to get dig into it a little bit more and see you know, what's going on in one of these layers, so right now, when we look at this latency chart, we're seeing um, request time, total request time broken down into layers. If we want to dig into a specific layer, such as the Rails layer, once we filter to a layer, now we're seeing uh, call time, uh, lat latency call time um, over the past hour here. For example, if we look right here, we have Rails spent an average of 13 milliseconds at that time. If, for example, this is a database layer, you might have a lot more than 100, 140 calls to a database layer, and you're not looking at the total time spent uh, in database layers for a specific request. You're just looking at the specific, a specific call to a database layer. So one specific call and the average of that call time. So the second part of this, this page is for incident response. If there's something going wrong with your application and you're using TraceView to find the answer, there's usually a few different things that could be going wrong with your application. One could be um, errors. You might be seeing a lot of 500 errors or your code is, is crashing in some way. 
if it's an error problem that you're trying to troubleshoot, there's two ways to do that. You can either go straight to the errors tab here, or if it's strictly a 500 error or 400 error, something specific that you're looking for, if you scroll down, we can actually filter by HD3 status codes. So if we click on the 500 errors here, now it's only showing us requests that ended up in, a, in HTTP status code of 500. So you can see over the past hour, these endpoints here um, had quite a few um, 500 errors when, when they were called. Um, like I said, the other way is we can go straight to the errors page. On this page, it shows you how many errors were occurring over time. It's a great place to watch to see if there was a big spike in errors or if this error has been continuing for a long time. Right now we're looking at the past hour, but we could change that to seven days, you know, eight hours, whatever makes sense to you at the time. When you're reading errors, we group common errors together. For example, this complex error here, it looks like a jam stack trace. We've seen it 358 times. So instead of list listing that 358 times individually, we group it together and show you how many times it occurred. If you actually want to see the individual um, traces that involve these errors, you can hit on the plus here, and you can see at what times these errors occurred, and if you click on one of these links, it'll take you to the specific trace where that error occurred so you can dig deeper. If we're not troubleshooting an error problem, if maybe it's a latency problem we're troubleshooting, there's a couple different steps we can take. The first thing to look for is on the latency graph, is our latency increasing proportionately? Are all the layers increasing? If that's the case, the next place to look is our total request down here. If request to our application is increasing alongside our latency increasing, it may be just host metrics and it may not be uh, a, a true performance issue. If we want to take it one step further, we can actually add a host metrics to this graph, such as CPU usage. We also have JVM metrics. So if, if what you saw was an incre gradual increase in latency that correlated with total request volume to your application, maybe even you saw some host metrics increase along with that, your problem is probably lack of resources on the host. If that's not the case, if we saw a, a disproportionate growth in layers, such as maybe the Django layer grew faster than all the others, so maybe our action view layer was very fast, maybe an Apache layer was very fast, but it was one specific layer that was, that was growing, what we could do is we could filter to that layer, such as maybe it was the memcache layer. And we could watch uh, its growth individually. The other thing we can do is we can use the request heat map. The request heat map differs from the layer breakdown page in a way that instead of drawing out an average, we're going to do a scatter plot instead so we can find outliers. If we look at the request heat map for the memcache layer, what we're looking at now is individual calls to the memcache layer. By default, this view filters down to the 95th percentile of calls. If we want to find all calls, if we want to look for those outliers and the very slow ones, you can simply hit show all calls, which I just did. Or you can even adjust your view to show um, the slow calls to the fast ones. So at this point, we see that the vast majority of our calls were very fast. It seems that we regularly have some slower ones, and then we have a few outliers near the top. If we want to find out what's going on in those, in those slow ones, in the outliers, we can click and drag. Now we've only selected two calls. And now that we've done that selection, it actually updates the filters down below. So we know, you know what, what domain and URL these, these calls happen to take place on, uh, the caching operation that it was, uh, even the host and which controller was involved in the call. Now at this point, we know they were slow. The next question is why? If we go to view traces, at this point, 
These are listing actual traces, which are actual transactions that came into the Ruby on Rails application. So if we click on this, now what this is showing us is this was an actual user transaction. We even have the user's IP. Uh, we have the time it took place on. We know the domain that it came in on, the controller, and the action, even the URL. Now what this is showing us down here is the actual flow of the transaction through the server. In this case, at the top here, the, the request entered the application at Apache, moved on to Rack, then moved on to Rails. Rails made a call to NetHttp, and if we click on NetHttp, we actually have even more information down here. We can see the remote host that was called, we can see the RPC, and if we want to, we even have a backtrace showing us exactly where, where in our code that this NetHttp um, layer was called. As you're reading these traces, it's important to know that the thick layers here are blocking layers. So when NetHttp was called, Rails is in fact waiting for the response from NetHttp. So at the entire duration of NetHttp, our code was basically blocked and we were waiting. Um, as we've selected this, you can actually see the total time we spent in this extent down here. Um, it's important to note that if you're looking at a more complex trace uh, that might have asynchronous methods, um, asynchronous extents like this will have uh, basically slash lines instead of a solid block, um, and that just indicates that they're not blocking the control flow uh, and they're taking place by themselves. Um, we were troubleshooting a memcache issue. We were wondering why it was taking so long. So if we find our memcache calls, which I've selected here, and I now use a right arrow to iterate through them, we can find the call here that took 73 milliseconds, which is the one we found on the heat map. We can see the remote host that was, that was used. Uh, we can see the caching operation. And then we can know kind of generally in our, in our, in our code, since we have back traces from some of these extents, approximately where it took place. So to kind of reiterate what we've done, we started on uh, the, the overview map. We found an application that had a little bit low latency or some errors. Then we went to the app server page of that specific app. We found, um, we filtered down to a specific layer such as memcache. We found the outliers on the heat map. Then we looked at that specific transaction. We used some backtraces. We looked at the kind of the general flow of the code. And we figured out exactly where that memcache call was, what operators it was, and what ca cache operation it used. This same uh, flow can be used to solve most, uh, app, uh, most problems in your application. If you find a unique trace that you want to share with your fellow developers, you can simply click Save at the top, and then it will um, show up in your Save Traces view. That's the general flow for TraceView, kind of going from the top, isolating where the problem is taking place, coming to the, to the layer breakdown, um, finding out what kind of problem it is, whether it be errors or latency or what have you, and then moving the, through the proper workflow to identify and find the specific trace where the problem is occurring.